through all my previous stuff. Uh, no, no, it's all great. In fact, uh, I mean, you're you're a voice of sanity. So, all right, let's um, let's get into this today. My guest is uh, the esteemed, illustrious uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor. He's a retired Army colonel. Uh, he is a government official, author, consultant, television commentator. He was the 2020 pick by President Donald Trump for uh, not just ambassador to Germany, but also, I think, uh, to be what national security advisor. And then you ended up as a consultant uh, for the Secretary of Defense. Is that is that correct? Senior advisor to Senior the advisor, Secretary of Defense. Yeah. And you're also the author of uh, three books that relate books. to- Five books, military strategy. Books. Excuse me, I, I looked on uh, Amazon here, and three came up. So, my mistake. Um, but uh, I'll have your books all linked below, so people can go uh, uh, definitely check those out. Um, let's start maybe with uh, you know the, the topic, which is Ukraine. Um, you know, I, I read in 2014 that th this was essentially a kind of a color revolution model that we get out of these figures like Gene Sharp um, and this sort of technology of democratic revolutions. And from my vantage point, it's not dem democracy that, that anybody's really concerned with bringing to these countries. Do you have that take? Do you think that's correct? Or do you have a different angle on what, what was really going on in 2014 when we had this, uh, this, this uh, what some have described as a coup in the Ukraine? No, I think that's accurate. I think there was an opportunity grasped by the U.S. government to effectively install someone in Kiev or Kiev who would be hostile to Moscow. And that was the goal, and I think they succeeded in doing it. They had a lot of support uh, from the Western Ukrainians, uh, much more so than anyone in the East. And the outcome is what you have today, which is, of course, an exaggeration. Uh, we, I'm, I'm not sure anybody had Zelensky in mind. He seems to have been picked up much later mm -hmm. uh, and uh, effectively groomed to step in, say the right kinds of things. And I'm sure your viewers are aware that he actually came across when he was promoted as the future president as a much more reasonable person. Uh, he wanted uh, peace with uh, Moscow and said so, and said mm -hmm. that if he were elected, that's what he would work for. Uh, but he was someone who, by, for instance, couldn't even speak a word of Ukrainian. He could only speak Russian when he was elected. So it took him some time to learn Ukrainian, and that was something of an embarrassment, because language is important in Ukraine. The further east you go, the more Russian you hear, but in the west, you, you hear pure Ukrainian, which is uh, has a lot of Polish, Lithuanian, and German in it, uh, words that are not present in uh, Russian. Yeah, and I think that uh, there was, you know, there's so many elements to that uh, 2014 situation that kind of stuck out to me as, as suspicious. Um, I know you're you're a very measured commentator, so I don't want to uh, get into topics that you know you, you don't uh, find interesting or or uh, confirmed per se. But I do remember, and I I had to look to find this article, but there was an Italian article, uh, Il Journal, which was talking about the uh, in that queue that that there were uh, uh, snipers that were firing into the crowd and that this was actually a technique and a model that has been used in other situations. I think Syria had a similar situation where these sort of uh, protests were sort of cooked up, people fired into the crowd. And this was actually uh, uh, an engineered, a plan thing to, to lead to this coup, which to me, as you said, really just suggests uh, uh, Western interference. And does this go back uh, in terms of the way that World War One, World War Two saw the Ukraine as a strategic location. If, if I recall, I think Hitler saw this as a key place to to control, to sort of keep Russia at bay. And does this relate, perhaps, to the the holdovers of the uh, Abwehr and the 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 Azov Battalion, these kinds of uh, nationalist, uh, hyper nationalist groups, the uh, right sector, probably sector Azov? Is it something that has been there uh, since World War Two, basically? Well, let me pause for a minute and go back and just remind your readers of something they may not, or your viewers, that uh, something they may not be aware of. But in 1995, uh, there was an incident in Sarajevo involving the use of a mortar that fired into a crowd of people on market day in downtown Sarajevo. Uh, it, it did serious damage, and that was then the trigger that ultimately brought the United States directly into the Balkan crisis, if you remember. Well, we know that uh, that mortar round or mortar rounds were fired not by the Serbs, but by the Bosniaks themselves against their own people. 
So that's a good example of what you were talking about. So this is not a new phenomenon, certainly since 1991. We've had lots of things occur. And uh, it turned out that it was it was false. Now, when you go back to World War One and World War Two, World War One was a very different setting. In fact, if you stopped any of the Ukrainians in, in Ukraine and said, what are you? They would probably describe themselves as either a Christian who lives here or a Catholic who lives here. In other words, the strong sense of national identity that you see now simply wasn't there. Right. There were a few, but not many. All of that changes with uh, the Bolshevization of, uh, the so of, of Tsarist Russia, which became the Soviet Union. And over many, many years, millions of human beings were murdered and slaughtered, right. uh, in not just Ukraine, but in Russia as well. Millions of Russians were killed. We think perhaps 30 million people were killed between 1919 and 1939. Uh, at least uh, 8 million, perhaps 9 in uh, Ukraine. Uh, a lot of this was uh, orchestrated famine. Some right. of it some of it was deportation and some of it was outright shooting and murder. This left a, a huge uh, mark on, on the population. And uh, the, the Baltic states from Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia had been under Russian rule, but then they fell under Soviet rule for a brief period of time until the uh, Germans invaded in 1941. Now, the, the other thing that we don't usually talk about, which is very important to understand, is that unfortunately, tragically, if you were living in Eastern Europe at the time and you were Jewish, you were linked to communism. Whether or not you were a communist didn't matter very much. And that was because of the very prominent role played by senior officials in the Communist Party by Jews in Eastern Europe. So you have this terrible, uh, explosive mix of hatred, hatred for communism, hatred for Russians and hatred for Jews. They all seem to have merged, even though, to be let's, let's be frank, everybody in the mix was a was a victim. Uh, the Ukrainians yeah. were victims, and, and the Second World War just made matters worse. And when the Germans moved in, uh, they took advantage of, of the fact that they were dealing on the periphery of Russia, uh, at least a third of what we call the Soviet Union, with millions of people who were already anti-Russian and anti-communist. In the book, that, the last book that I published in Margin of Victory, the third chapter is about the Soviet-German uh, War, or Soviet-Nazi War, and specifically on an operation that happens in, in June and July of 1944. But I explain in the run-up the kinds of attitudes that persisted. And uh, these attitudes never went away because after the Soviets came in, of course, they treated virtually every population they encountered the same way. They walked in, they treated anybody they met as a, a potential adversary or enemy raped all the women they could find and the rest is history so they didn't make very many friends on their liberation let's put it this way there was no liberation they were simply conquering ugliness was driven underground for many many years inside the Soviet Union. you will also remember that the soviets used to talk this goes back to lenin and trotsky and bukhari and the rest they were trying to erase national identity Yes. eliminate religion and so they tried to create something called the soviet man this was some sort of nondescript homogenized human being with no self-consciousness whatsoever or self-awareness who was simply a member of the collective well the, the joke uh, in moscow in 1991 92 93 was suddenly the soviet state collapsed everyone looked around for all the soviet men they didn't see any <laughs> what they saw were Russians, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, yep. Latvians, you know, just go down the list of all the various Tartars, Mongols, Turks, and so forth. So the, the whole thing foundered. And I think, unfortunately, in the 1990s, these, these problems began to reassert themselves. And there was no one in the United States at the time who was really willing to engage intelligently to deal with any of it. I mean, I'm not I'm not a uh, great fan of Spigneff Brzezinski, but Brzezinski at least had the presence of mind to go to President Clinton in the 90s and say, look, these borders that we have for Ukraine and Russia make no sense. And he tried to point out that the people in eastern Ukraine, east of the upper river, in his view, were largely Russified. Mm -hmm. And we, we need to change the borders. If we don't change the borders, Crimea is Russian, 
much of eastern Ukraine is Russian, will eventually see conflict there. No one was particularly interested. You had a similar problem with the economy. We sent over lots of people who probably meant well, but gave the Russians terrible advice. Joseph Stiglitz, a Nobel Prize winner, was one of the exceptions. And he said, look, we're trying to make these people go cold turkey. They haven't lived in a true free market ever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in their lives. It was a catastrophe. You put all of this together and you eventually end up with Putin. And Putin comes in as seen as someone who understands what a catastrophe it is and is willing to take steps to address it. It takes him many years. Whether we like Putin or not, whether you, you approve right. of him, it's all irrelevant. The truth is that he's a Russian patriot and is viewed as one by most of the people in Russia. And he pulled Russia out of a terrible situation. And he's going to the oligarchs. Yep. And these are the people that raped Russia when they had the opportunity to do so. Most of them now are living outside the country because they had to leave or they were going to end up being imprisoned or executed. Yeah, fl fleeing to the UK. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, I had read that, uh, if I recall, there was even some Senate or congressional hearings in the 90s into this uh, looting of Russia that, re that related to a lot of the crew out of Harvard, the, the Harvard crew, these kinds of uh, uh, economist people who then sort of divvied up and figured out how to, with the collusion of these people, um, privatize and sort of buy off and, and, and rape Russia, so to speak. And then that's what led to the, the era of Putin that you're talking about. And that's really just objective factuality. It's it's, it's looking at the this, this situation objectively. It's not trying to uh, run propaganda here, which is really what we yeah. see so much, uh, especially in the West, that this, the media is just wild. I mean, just every day it's the, the most ridiculous stories for the last eight months. Well, even going back to 2014, uh, um, you know, portraying P uh, Putin as Hitler when, I mean... <laughs> This is so contrary to the you know fundamentals of the history of, of Russia, you know, fighting Hitler uh, in World War II to, to, to well, portray. When you, talk, you know, when you so go, Jay, J, if you look for a minute at this thing called the Azov Regiment and yeah. these Nazis that are running around in Ukraine, uh, these people, in most cases, have no idea what they're doing. In other words, they're fascinated with uh, the Nazi mystique that they heard from their grandfathers or what are whatever, because the Germans were widely viewed as liberators. Mm -hmm. But people don't know the whole story. There were 1.5 million Soviet citizens in the German Wehrmacht, 750,000 Russians, 250,000 Ukrainians, and another 500,000 people who were Tartars, Mongols, Turks, Georgians, Armenians, and so forth. Uh, these people were happy to join the war on communism. And Hitler's great yeah. failure, of course, was to take advantage of that. There were millions of former Soviet soldiers in prison camps that uh, uh, Marshal Vlasov wanted to organize as uh, into Russian armies of liberation to go, go out and fight shoulder to shoulder with the Wehrmacht. They had plenty of Russian equipment they'd captured or Soviet equipment that they could equip them with. It, it didn't happen. But I think people don't understand the scale of, of anger and hatred. Well, all of this is suppressed. It begins to come out in the 90s. Brzezinski understood that, wanted to put forward some sort of solution. Now, people will say he's fundamentally anti-Russian. Fine, he is. And he wanted to do harm to Russia, perhaps. But no one was really interested in dealing with it. And tragically, you had a similar situation in 1919 at Versailles. Nobody at Versailles understood Eastern Europe. It was a black hole. It was just this vast area ruled by the czar with millions and millions of people that no one knew anything about or understood that were not really, in, in the view of most people sitting at Versailles, part of the so-called West. And whenever the Germans and Austrians and Hungarians would step forward and try to explain things, they were sort of, sort of told, thanks, we don't care. So the, the, everything we see now begins in 1919 with misguided solutions. It gets much worse as a result of World War II because Stalin did terrible things, changed borders, pushed millions of people around, killed tens of millions. So here we sit and we've had all the wrong people intervene into this thing for, for reasons that make no sense in my judgment. People that see some benefit to destroying Russia, to dismember it, to steal its resources, I don't see any benefit to anybody to doing that. And uh, most of all, the principal victims right now, once again, are Ukrainians because uh, they've been mobilized and pushed into a war that I don't think they needed to fight. I mean, if you go back to 29 March and look at the what was on the table then from the Russians, what they wanted, 
it, it was something that the Ukrainians could have accepted easily. Number one, of course, was uh, neutrality. Neutrality, don't join NATO. They frankly didn't care about the EU, but they said, look, you can't join NATO. That's off the off the table. Be neutral. Number two, the two autonomous republics need to be autonomous. They need to a lot be allowed to, to govern themselves and they'll stay inside Ukraine. The rest of the Russians that live in Ukraine, there were millions of them, need to be allowed to speak their language, go to school, learn in their language. In other words, live lives with equal rights before the law. And then finally, stop the nonsense about Crimea. It's never been, quote unquote, really part of Ukraine. It's Russian. We're not giving it up. We've controlled it since the 1770s. That was what they wanted. And then they said, we would like to have a representative of the Kremlin sitting on the National Defense Council of, of Ukraine. We're simply interested in that. We want to make sure that you abide by the essentially the Austrian-style treaty that would have been implemented uh, in Ukrainian neutrality. And the Russians, by the way, maintained somebody like that in, in Vienna, Austria, for many years after the state treaty was signed. It all fell apart. We didn't want it. Zelensky is just a mouthpiece for Washington and the oligarchs, and he's rejected everything. And so here we are. Uh, and people are saying, oh, well, the Ukrainians are winning. And the Ukrainians have been winning now since 24 February. I was going to say, that, that, that's, that's what the media, Ukrainians. Has, yeah, the media has constantly yeah. said this. Like, we keep hearing, uh, you know, oh, Putin's lost, Putin's lost, Putin's lost. And then why are they having to keep say that, saying this if, if he lost, you know? Or the ago. Russians have run out of ammunition. Yeah, the Russians yeah. have run out of this, run out of that, and the Russians can't can't bring in any more troops. And uh, it's all nonsense. Yeah. But from the very beginning, Putin, I think, made some invalid assumptions. Mm -hmm. First of all, he used a very small force because he believed that once he demonstrated that he was serious, that there would be a willingness to negotiate. I think he actually believed that. Uh, he also gave strict instructions to his commanders: "I don't want to kill civilians. I don't want to destroy infrastructure." We want to minimize all of that with the hope of, of getting out of this with the minimal conditions that I just described. And after all, this is a brother Slavic country. This is another Slavic country like Russia. We're not interested in murdering Slavs. We don't want to do this. Well, all of that went by the wayside. But he played along until the summer. And then in the summer, he had a come to Jesus meeting with his military commanders. And they were never comfortable with what he wanted to do because they didn't believe in it. So he had to make a number of changes, and he now has a theater commander, this man, Sorovikin. And essentially what he has said, conditions have changed. We will now treat Ukraine as a war zone. That's very important because they haven't done that. Yeah. They never had more than 20% of the Soviet armed forces engaged in this conflict. That's changed. You're going to have as many as 700,000 Russian forces in and around Ukraine before this thing is over. That includes the, the 300,000 mobilized reserves, but it also includes virtually all of the professional army and the Air Force and so forth. And uh, we're going to end this war. The only way it can end is if we go in and we absolutely eradicate the armed forces. They keep talking about denazification, which is not unreasonable because the Ukrainians, particularly these Nazis, have committed a number of terrible mm -hmm atrocities against Russian soldiers and Russian civilians. We don't cover it. We don't talk about it. In fact, uh, Sky News and CNN were both, I don't know if it's permanent, but temporarily stripped of their uh, news credentials inside uh, Ukraine because they showed pictures of people with Nazi insignia and giving Heil Hitler salutes on the way into Kherson. The, the place the Ukrainians are now trying to convince everybody they liberated when, in fact, the Russians simply chose to temporarily withdraw. So here we sit and we're waiting for this winter. We're waiting for the ground to freeze. And people don't understand that Ukraine, the black soil of Ukraine, is very deep. It, it varies from four feet deep up to 12 or 15 feet deep, depending upon where you are. This is the breadbasket. You were talking about Ukraine's criticality to uh, the Germans in World War II. Absolutely. They very definitely were concerned about it because 400,000 Germans had starved to death during World War I as a result of the British blockade. So they wanted to be sure that they would produce enough food for everyone in, during the Second World War. And in fact, they did. Up until the war ended, everybody in Germany ate. Uh, so there are reasons why people went in and did things. And the, the attitudes of Ukrainians were not uniformly uh, 
pro-Hitler and they were not uniformly uh, supportive of Stalin or, or against Stalin. But large, large numbers were very pleased to have the Germans administer the country. I interviewed large numbers of them back in the 1980s. They were still alive when I was in graduate school. And I used to say, well, what was the difference between Stalin and Hitler? Said under Stalin, they stole our land, we starved or were deported and shot. Under Hitler, we ate and they gave us our land back and there was order. So, I mean, very sim simplistic uh, formula. So that was true in Ukraine. And But this thing that we're seeing now, this crazy uh, Nazi imitation, which is sick, is dredging up all the wrong images for all the wrong reasons. It has nothing to do with the world that you and I live in. It has nothing to do with the world that Ukrainians and Russians live in. And Russia today, if it's like anything, it's very much like czarist Russia, which was an imperfect state structure, but it nevertheless was a, a very humane structure compared with what followed it. Yeah, if I recall, too, there, there's a connection between going back to like the 1930s, there was this transition from uh, where the Ukrainian nationalism transitioned to like the Galen organization and CIA training later on. I mean, not, not in the 1930s, another the CIA's uh, 1947 OSS yeah. and all that. But yeah. so that so that the, there is this history of a Western connection to this sort of radicalism there uh in the ukraine i think that's sort of a tool right like a proxy thing that's going on in my, in my estimation we see this as well with things like uh, isis where we'll you know john mccain goes and he's pictured with these you know these radicals uh in syria uh, and then we see john mccain going and he's pictured with <laughs> radicals in the ukraine uh, several years ago and so this is this is that proxy war that you're talking about and um it reminded me too of uh in some of the podcasts that you've done recently, you mentioned this um, this uh, this need on the part of the West to make sure that there's a division between Germany and Russia. And I remember Dr. Carol Quigley going into a lot of depth about that in his writings, because that was always a necessary Western strategy to make sure that there was not any joining between uh, Germany and Russia. And that was that was a plan that Lenin had. Lenin wanted to unite with with Germany, and the West was involved in sort of making sure that that didn't happen. And so I think that, that that seems to play into what's going on right now, because, you know, I know you're, you're, you're measured on your analysis of the Nord Stream uh, uh, pipeline. But to me, it looks like that's a pretty clear indicator that this was to make sure that there wasn't any kind of, you know, energy uh, connection uh, corridor there between Germany and Russia. No, I think so, Jay. The only thing I would say is that if you go back through the last 300 years of European history, Russo-German relations were very good just as British-German relations were very good. Until 1914, no English-speaking soldier had shot at a German-speaking soldier and vice versa. Had not happened. Uh, in, until 1914, after 1760, I would say 1761 or I guess 62, 1762 during the Seven Years' War, there was a brief period where uh, the predecessor to Catherine the Great, uh, it was Elizabeth who was the uh, Tsarina. She had allied herself with Austria and France against Prussia. Although the, that war was not as we think of it. I mean, for instance, the Russians occupied East Prussia and part of Pomerania, which was German for most of the war, treated everyone well, uh, routinely sent letters to Frederick the Great, uh, reassuring him that everything was in good shape. All I mean, it was not, not, not as we understand it, and once uh, you get uh, her successor, Peter, and then subsequently Catherine, the Russians pull out. So from 1762 until 1914, relations with the Russians had been essentially very positive. Uh, there had been ups and downs uh, in a foreign policy sense. But, you know, for the most part, it was a very positive thing. And by the way, they were all related. So if, you, if you're mm -hmm. looking for three countries for whom World War I never made any sense, it was Great Britain, Germany, and Tsarist Russia. Well, tragically, that was all destroyed. Uh, but even after the war, there was a rapid restoration of good feelings and relations, in most cases, between the British and the Germans and between the, the Russians and the Germans. Now, the Germans took some time to figure out that the Bolsheviks were different. They did understand that. And eventually, they recognized that this was something they could not cooperate with long term. But still, they cooperated well into 1941. And, and frankly, they could have done that for at least another year or so before the Soviets attacked them. So any, anyhow, the, the point I'm trying to make is that 
in our efforts to try and destroy what is a natural relationship between Germany and Russia, I think we're making absolutely certain that it will be restored. In 1914, Russia, Tsarist Russia, was Germany's number one trading partner. Mm -hmm. And in 1914, Germany was Russia's number one trading partner. In 1941, the same thing was true with the Soviet Union and Germany. In fact, I, I met the man who is a young captain in the German army, captured a German train headed into Russia to deliver uh, various machine machinery production facilities, this, this kind of business, while another train coming from Russia loaded with timber, precious metals, so forth, was captured. I mean, this whole thing is not new. It's going to be restored. And I think by doing what we've done, we, we will have succeeded in alienating both the Germans and the Russians. The very thing that we said we didn't want, now we're going to get it. Because we insist on seeing anything that happens, if we don't control it and we don't see ourselves directly benefiting, it must be bad. Mm -hmm. You have the same thing right now between China and Russia. China desperately needs natural gas, oil, and all the byproducts, along with the minerals that Russia has and the foodstuffs that Russia produces in great quantities. And they're doing a box office business with each other. We keep treating this as something bad. It's natural. I mean, it would be, it would be like saying that we in Canada shouldn't trade. Well, that's absurd. It makes infinite sense for us to trade. The same thing is true for the Germans and the Russians. We have too many people that want to live in the past and refuse to live in a future. Or in if you enjoyed this video, be sure and take use of the promo code for the show sponsor for this channel sponsor, which is chalk.com. That's C-H-O-Q.com. You can find the links in the description below the video. You get 50% off any of the great organic actually better than organic supplements that they offer at chalk.com if you want to support my channel the best way to do that is to head on over there and use that promo code j50 that's j50 to get 50 percent off you can also use the recurring subscription of j53 life that's j53 life if you want to sign up for automatic recurring subscriptions on those excellent supplements health is absolutely necessary in combating the toxic culture that we live in I also would say if you want to get access to my books, head on over to the shop at my website and get signed copies there. Thank you. The present, for that matter, that's very different. Everything is not threatening to us. Other people's success is not our misfortune by any stretch of the imagination. But we've, we've really pushed this in the wrong direction. So the thing that you're mentioning, which is probably more important than anything else that will come out of this war, is there will be a rapprochement between Berlin and Moscow. And that will become permanent, in my estimation. That's why I've always feared that NATO would crumble and fragment as a result of this if it lasted more than a few months. I think we're well on our way to that right now. Did that begin, this, this uh, failing uh, path of NATO, when it moved from defensive to offensive? I think you talked about that in the 90s with uh, yeah. what the, the Bosnia and then this transition to this offensive thing. Is that the beginning of this path of collapse for NATO? Oh, I think so. You know, in 1994, 95, most of us that were had been stationed there felt that this was a good time to leave. There was no threat whatsoever from the former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. The former Soviet Union was gone. Right. And we needed to get out. And the last thing that we needed to do was to try and transform this alliance into our pet project for offensive military use elsewhere. We decided that we were going to launch some sort of crusade beginning in the Balkans for, quote unquote, democracy, mm -hmm. and that this crusade would eventually find its way to Moscow. That's what got started in 1995. Right. It's lunacy. And it was never necessary. There was no willingness to let these states evolve to become whatever it was that they were going to become. We, we also failed to understand that the world of technology has changed. You can't repeat many of the things that happened during World War II because the technology won't allow it. You can't cross the Atlantic Ocean with thousands of ships carrying troops and equipment. They'll never get there. Eisenhower understood that in the 1950s. That's why Eisenhower said the solution uh, is more Austria's. He thought we should neutralize as much of Eastern Europe and the Balkans as possible. He said, we can't defend them all, it's impossible. The Russians will always have the strategic advantage 
But if we neutralize them, that will solve a huge part of the problem. Well, Eisenhower was right. Again, after, after we started in Bosnia, we then moved on to Kosovo. We continue to prosecute this war. Remember, the, the battle cry at the time was, if we're not out of area, we're out of business. In other words, NATO must go out of area or it's out of business. Well, you're dealing with an alliance of people where there's very little to hold them together in terms of threat perception. If you live in Spain or Italy, your perception of the threat is largely from the Middle East and North Africa. You certainly don't feel threatened by the Russians. And that was true in, in 1998 and 99, when I was still serving at Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe. The French, frankly, saw it in the same light. You know, the Germans sort of sat in the middle and said, well, we didn't sign up to go to war. We signed up to, do, to be part of a defense community. Yep. Why, why are we doing these things? And so we began sort of grudgingly dragging people into this sort of thing. And it's been a catastrophe in my judgment. The people that are most enthusiastic are always the people that are further, uh, farther away than anybody else. Canada, the Canadians will sign up. The Norwegians will sign up. The, the Swedes. To... In other words, if you're not in the immediate path of the disaster that we're creating by the conflict that we're promoting, well, then fine, let's go for it. And they're willing to believe the propaganda that Russia is entirely evil and Ukraine is some sort of pristine democracy that has to be protected at all costs. Well, it's all nonsense. No, nothing could be further from the truth. Yeah, you mentioned Brzezinski. It makes me think back to, uh, you know, in Grand Chess War and Strategic Vision, you know, he, he talks about the importance of Ukraine and, and what the West has to do to, you know, control this locale because that's the control of the heartland, right? Mm. Um, and so it, are, what, it's, if, if Russia had this transition and sort of uh, underwent this collapse in the 90s and it, becomes something, it became something different, is the modus operandi just to continually make sure that we keep them at bay? I mean, from the Western uh, Atlantis' perspective, to just make sure that they're sort of uh, in their own domain and, and, and weak to a degree. And is, is all of what's going on really just to make sure that they don't become something more powerful uh, be, beyond what something that the West could control? Is that is that the modus operandi here? Because I remember Dr. Quigley saying something to the effect of that basically the two world wars of the last century were in the Cold War were basically just to uh, maintain and deplete and sort of exhaust the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire and Russia. The, the two main competitors to the uh, Anglo-American establishment had to be weakened and sort of just contained. Um, is that really what's still going on with this overall strategy with, with uh, the Ukraine? Well, I think uh, the Anglo-American viewpoint is is largely unchanged. We want to be in control of everything. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, we will set out to weaken uh, any combination of states or state that we think threatens our dominance. We dominate the financial system. And uh, as a result of dominating the financial system, we've been able to ship trillions of dollars of debt overseas to other people. Uh, we certainly don't want to change that particular relationship, but in truth, uh, we've gone too far, and I think we're going to see all of that change. I think we're going to watch the dollar-based international mm -hmm. commerce go away. It's going to take time because the institutions that have to compete with ours don't exist, but they will, and that's what you hear with the BRICS. You know, that's what Russia, India, and China are talking about. But I think strategically, there's also this undercurrent that... Uh, we have to not just weaken, but ultimately destroy the regime in Moscow, mm -hmm. because that's the pathway to isolating and ultimately to control and dominate China. This is this uh, sort of no nonsensical notion that uh, we will never be safe until everyone else is destroyed. This, of course, is what happened with Napoleon Bonaparte. Mm. Bonaparte could have called it quit several times. He could have lasted you know, for another 30, 40 years before he passed away. And he could have had a much larger and more uh, powerful French empire in Europe. But he, he was always consumed with the possibility that someone else would come out of the woodwork and challenge him. And so they, he impaled himself on this Russia expedition when there was no need to do so. The outcome was that Germany rises in revolt, combines with Russia, and ultimately destroys uh, Bonaparte and France. The British, of course, didn't contribute much to it except money, gold. And uh, the gold that came out of London financed the Prussians and the Russians and everybody else that was German 
to fight Bonaparte. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're in a similar situation right now, and they're thinking in terms of doing this to Russia as a step on the road to dealing with China. I think it's very foolish. It's not going to work. They completely miscalculated. The intelligence assessments were all wrong. Russia has always been swimming in an abundance of minerals, precious metals, food, agriculture, oil, gas, all of it. How do you isolate a country like that? That's an impossibility because everyone wants to buy from it. Everyone needs Russia. Uh, where are you going to get your fertilizer if you can't get it from Russia and white Russia? And now you can't get it from Ukraine, obviously, because you've got a war underway. How do you how do you feed yourself? I mean, they're responsible for so much of, of the food in the world, and we yeah. can't supplant that. And then, of course, you have this state, which is not really dependent on us and has been working to become financially independent of us. And that's something else that has bothered the the financial gurus and oligarchs in the West that Russia doesn't want to be in debt. It yeah. doesn't want to be under, under our thumbs. Uh, it's, it's impossible to defeat Russia unless you go to the nuclear level. And at that point, if you try to do it, then you're going to be completely annihilated yourself. Russia has the largest stockpile of nuclear weapons in the world. That's insane. So nobody's going to use nuclear weapons. So that drives you back down to high end conventional operations. How are you going to do that? We're not going to mobilize for war. We can't even recruit enough quality soldiers for the United States Army and Marines, let alone Navy and Air Force. Who are we kidding? Uh, is the United States prepared to mobilize itself for a full-on war in the middle of what? 30 uh, marching under the dollars? marching under the banner of wokeness and rainbows. Uh. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's all. It doesn't make any sense. So this right. this thing is going to end. It's not going to end well for us. It's going to end badly for us. I think Russia will come out just fine, and the Ukrainians will end up being the principal victims. But the Europeans are going to be furious because they're all they're all suffering economically because of this war. That's why they're now admitting to Ukraine fatigue. It's very real. Yeah, this makes me think, too, uh, you mentioned in your recent uh, op-ed piece at American Conservative, the Morgenthau plan, and I was just reading about that a couple of days ago in a, in a book that's a, sort of the history of socialism and how this Morgenthau plan was a, a sort of a, a debt reconstructing to, you know, reconstructed to put Germany into debt uh, in the post-war period. And I think you were likening that to the, to the present situation that the, the, the exportation of democracy and human rights is a cover really to just sort of in uh, put these uh, uh, countries into debt in in terms of future generations that was a big insight that i read in, in quickly as well that you know this is really uh, uh the restructuring of these countries as you said to to do regime change to then put the next generation into debt so we're, we're exporting not just this cover this faux human rights thing but in fake democracy that's all a cover for uh debt-based control for for these countries but like you said it, it seems to me that you can't continually run an empire on uh, infinite debt i mean it has to pop at some point right well one thing one would think so i'm surprised it hasn't already popped but i think right. we're getting closer but when it comes to germany you have a self-destructive regime and society that has been brainwashed into loathing itself yeah uh, you know, I, I'm very pro-Israel. I've always been very supportive of the state of Israel for reasons that have to do with what happened in the Second War. And also, I think they they deserve to have a state. Everybody who thinks, well, it should be somewhere else, that's fine. Unfortunately, it's not. It's where it is. So we need to get along with that. Uh, and I, I still feel that way. But the Germans have dealt, have engaged in something that people frequently talk about, the self-loathing Jews that hate Israel. Uh, there, I, I don't see them as a big threat but to Israel, but you have a lot of self-loathing Germans that have been brainwashed over the last 50, 60 years to see right. themselves in a you know, permanent negative context. Now, the result of it right now is that this regime is deindustrializing Germany. Yeah. That's a catastrophe, not just for Germany. It's a catastrophe for Europe and the world. I mean, the German economy is what, third or fourth in the world right. on any day? And if you deindustrialize it by robbing it of access to cheap energy, mm -hmm. you're going to destroy the scientific industrial base. That scientific industrial base is very important to us. It's very important to Russia. And everybody says, well, you don't want to make yourselves dependent upon Russia, but Russia is dependent on Germany. Mm -hmm. It has been for decades, right. hundreds of years for access to machinery, engineering, technology. 
we treat this we treat this thing as i said earlier something bad for us it doesn't have to be bad at all but now germany is being destroyed how much longer will this go on before the germans wake up that's why this nord stream 2 fiasco is so destructive yeah because if you want good relations in the world where do you want good relations you want good relations with moscow berlin beijing and i would argue also tokyo tokyo is a sleeping giant oh they're going to go into a lot of trouble because they have their own financial issues but they're going to come out tokyo has a brilliant scientific industrial base very high human capital you you want to look around at what is critical in 21st century high human capital germany has it israel has it tokyo has it we have it if we'll if we'll preserve it and advance it and cultivate it instead mm -hmm. of actively attacking it which is what we've been doing so if you look at those things everything we're doing is antithetical to our interests right now yeah right and we're going to end up with enemies uh all over the world I mean, we're destroying all the goodwill that we we ever enjoyed during the Cold War. Do you see that? Uh, in, does this possibly fit into the overall plan of the deindustrialization of the West as a long term game plan to bring us under a kind of a post industrial world where we have this sort of technocracy and this, this so almost a dystopian sort of vision uh, out of the mind of people at Davos? Uh, who who want uh, you know a global federation and uh, the, the erasure of all nation states and this you know this this new era this new order that they're calling for that requires you know getting rid of cars getting rid of industry getting rid of oil get, getting rid of all of the things that just so happen to really undergird the West including the dollar and moving to some sort of uh, you know electronic CBDC or something like this I mean does this uh, deindustrialization of Germany and the West fit into that overall project in your view? Well, it would seem so. I mean, clearly, the World Economic Forum uh, has an agenda that is ultimately destructive to Western civilization. Right. There's no question about it. This open borders thing is designed to dilute and ultimately destroy us, the people of the West. Uh, that, that's, that's absolutely unambiguously clear. Now, everybody wants to attach some sort of uh, grand strategy that's being hatched in Davos. I, I don't know that I would go that far. What I would say is that Sam Huntington was right when he wrote about these uh, super empowered people uh, that are part of this cosmopolitan elite mm -hmm. that feels no connection whatsoever to us. These are people with no national identity and no concern for national identity. They, they don't give a damn about anything, it would seem. Uh, and they seem to have embraced this sort of uh, Marxist construct which says that uh, people are irrelevant. You know, race, religion, language, culture are meaningless. Well, that's an interesting idea because we have a lot of evidence for the last several thousand years that they are absolutely vital and essential. Yeah. If, I take, if I take you on a trip to uh, Central Africa and you try to tell people there that their race, religion, language, and culture are meaningless, they're not going to sign on for that. You're not going to find anybody in Japan, Korea, China, or Vietnam to sign on for it. Who is signing on for this nonsense? Well, yeah. people in Western Europe, people in the United States, not everybody, but yeah. the elites. Yeah. These elites are cooperating, whether right. it's by design or it's accidental. But I think people, as a result of this crisis, where they're beginning to feel the pinch, when it gets very cold and people freeze, when they don't have enough to eat, they're going to look around and they're going to say, how did we get here? And they're going to point to Macron and they're going to point to Schultz. And they're going to point to Biden and they're going to say, these are the people that brought us to this point. It's not that simplistic. It's more complex than that, obviously. And it's an elite that crosses many boundaries. Right. You know, as as I like to say, they say, well, you think the Republicans should do this? The Democrats are well, tired of this. Where's the evidence that there's much difference? And now the one thing they can agree upon is that they don't want this man Trump ever again yeah. or anybody who agrees with him. Yeah. So now they're actively recruiting and pushing those that they think will be, quote unquote, acceptable to this Davos community on the right. Republican side. But the masses of humanity that live in our country and live in Western Europe, they're, they're not going to be so easily fooled this time. I think they're going to suddenly begin to wake up, but you only wake up under pain. And the pain is only just beginning. Just look at the housing market. How many people have lost right. their life savings now? 
it's it's a catastrophe. It's coming. It's going to get worse, and you can't fix it with the Fed. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, people were talking a lot about this uh, recent, you know, uh, FTX uh, crypto exchange collapse, which appears to have been a, just sort of a, a slush fund to send money to the Democratic Party and then <laughs> to billions of dollars to nobody knows where. Um, and but this sort of uh, Ponzi scheme collapse, this rug pull situation with FTX appears to really just kind of be the way the economy itself runs. <laughs> the, the economy itself, the Federal Reserve model, is this sort of rug pull, long term, uh, uh, you know, collapse model. That's um, yeah. And Dr. Quigley even talks about the boom bust model kind of being manipulated throughout different decades that they can kind of engineer and steer the boom bust cycle. And uh, but eventually, you know, these fiat currencies they always collapse. So I, I can't imagine this continuing on for, you know, too much longer. Um, but that, again, puts us in that post-industrial world that a lot of people want, want to see come, up, come about because they're committed to this bizarre cult of, of eco-worship where they feel like, you know, humanity uh, is itself the problem and, and that we have to get rid of humanity, all these bizarre occultic ideas. Um, well, I think, uh, I yeah. think this... Uh this crisis is coming is going to be sort of enron cubed there you go yeah, yeah and yeah. as a result i think it's going to wake a lot of people up and people yeah. are not going to listen to the nonsense anymore and eventually i had someone the other day said you know i used to really worry about this climate change until i figured out that if two or three volcanoes erupt this year yeah you're going to reduce the temperature of the planet by a degree he said so why are we spending billions hundreds of billions of dollars and destroying people's jobs and livelihood because we're trying to lower the temperature when two or three volcanoes will do it anyway. Uh, I, I think we're going to see more and more and more of that sort of thing. I think the scam is is going to be revealed. But remember, and you understand this, a lot of these things have been converted into theology. I mean, you can't have a rational discussion about data because it's it's become religious. Yeah, it's a cult, right? Yeah. Yeah. Either you believe in, in what I believe in or you're the enemy. Right. And that's what they've managed to do. Now, what do the people at the top, what does Schwab really believe or Bill Gates or, or any number of these people? I, I have no idea. Who knows? Because they're, they're at the level of manipulators. They are oligarchs and they're dabbling and playing. Uh, that's about it. But that can end very suddenly. It ended in 1789 in France. It ended in 1917 in Russia. It ended in 1932 in Germany. It ended very suddenly in 1935, 36, 37 in Spain. These things suddenly stop because the population becomes aware and says enough is enough. Yeah, I like that you you know you look to history. I, I think that uh, uh, not many people understand that you know history repeats. We have to look back to similar situations and these these kinds of cycles that reoccur. And this idea of creating a new man, this sort of cult of uh, uh, a tabula rasa that the individual or this, all of society can be this blank slate where all of the history, the heritage, the the uh, ethnic identity, all those things are social constructs and you can just recreate and, and make it uh, from like silly pun. You're like, we're, we're Gumby people that can be sort of uh, molded into something new. That's all French revolutionary ideas that failed. And mm -hmm. the same people in charge today have the exact same ideology. They're not identical to, you know, Robespierre or Danton, but they basically have the same ideology. Sure. <laughs> it always fails. It does. And I think that's that's kind of where we are right now. And it has a, an appeal to generations of people that are unfamiliar with the past right. and have grown up in an environment where there was no stress. There was no pressure to perform. I mean, it, this this is pervasive throughout our society. If I look at the military... Uh, I watched over the last 30 years as a sort of systematic erosion of the foundations of discipline and performance, mm -hmm. the absence of any accountability for anybody who did anything. I mean, it's just, it's just appalling. General officers are the least accountable. Seems as though it doesn't matter how many times they failed. You know, Churchill once said, uh, success involves uh, moving from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. Well, I, I, I sort of agree, except that I see no success on the horizon. I just see enthusiasm for failure over and over and over again. And then there's this view that Trotsky expressed. It said uh, one of his uh, party members, workers came to him and said, well, Commissar, comrade, we can't uh, print this. This is not true. He said, comrade, don't worry about it. Paper will put up with anything you put on it. 
So we have a perversion of the uh, Churchillian model about going from failure to failure to failure to without loss of enthusiasm combined with the big lie. If you keep telling people something is true, eventually it sinks in and they believe it because they're stupid. They're sheep. Well, the sheep are not good sheep once they can't eat or drink, once they can't uh, stay warm. Mm -hmm. The sheep become lions. And of course, that's what happened in, in 1789. I mean, everybody knew there were problems in France. It had been, been going on for decades. It was right. a disaster. Right. Right. Here's the richest country at that time, the richest right. country in Europe, one of the richest in the world. The, you know, the seat of, of knowledge, technology, science, mathematics, music, art. Paris was everything under Louis XIV. But by 1789, everything had gone, had become entropic. And finally, finally, the, the population in Paris could not afford to pay for bread. Yeah. That brought on the revolution. So, you know, something bad happens. You're never quite sure what the trigger is, sort of like a black swan. There's, Nassim Talib talks about this. Mm -hmm. You know, when is it a black swan? Well, it's a black swan when it's a black swan. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> you know, something that I've noticed you uh, touch on throughout uh, interviews, uh, I don't want to keep you too much longer, but um, you, you've mentioned a pattern of things like the U.S. being significantly dumbed down, you know, the average citizen being intentionally, I think, intentionally dumbed down through the uh, you know long term uh, alterations of the education system. Charlotte Ezerbit has a great book on that. Uh, you mentioned the uh, demoralization and alterations in the U.S. military. Uh, you've mentioned even, uh, you know, fentanyl and, and, and the, the hundreds of 100,000 or something like that uh, deaths that have occurred. Uh, to me, it looks like as we sort of go through these things that you've mentioned, it almost looks like a, a, a warfare, a siege, a kind of like uh, attempted deconstructing of our country, our civilization. I mean, we see these patterns. We're not supposed to recognize patterns. It's, it's, you're bad if you do that. But uh, do, is it is it possible that this is an intentional deconstructing of the U.S. of our economy of our of our morale to to break us down? Well, it's hard it's hard to resist that conclusion. I mean, if, if anybody reads your work about Hollywood and looks at the manipulation of symbols, right, uh, and their meanings, uh, people are confused now. People have lost a sense of themselves. There, there's this line from uh, the movie Braveheart, where the man who played Robert the Bruce tries to tell uh, Mel Gibson, who's playing Sir William Wallace, and I like Mel, but he was the wrong guy to play Sir William Wallace, who was six foot seven, <laughs> and a, a human killing machine. He probably right. would have been better off with somebody like Dolph Lundgren. But at any rate, he says, uh, "You don't understand something, Wallace." This country has no sense of itself from top to bottom. I think that's where we are. And I think it's it's been, it's obviously deliberate. Uh, you see it uh, sort of transmitted through film, right? Uh, through radio, through television, through the internet, breaking down this notion that you as an individual are anything. And it's back to where we started with the Soviet man. It's a sort of more recent version of the same thing. It won't work. I think it's going to it's going to be arrested, but it will be because of uh, the economic uh, financial decline combined with what will ultimately be a, a governmental implosion. Mm. It'll be Sri Lanka like. I've used that sometimes in my office. Oh, come on, Doug. We could never be Sri Lanka. <laughs> right. Watch. And what happened in Sri Lanka when everything collapsed? The government got into its limousines and drove away. Yeah, People that all want power, and that's what all of these politicians want, is power. Why they want it is another matter, but they all want power. But when they get power and they're confronted with the legion of, of problems that we face today, what are they going to do? They don't have solutions. And our government, which was designed in the 1780s, was never designed to cope with the kinds of problems that we have. Right. So the, the me mechanism won't work. The machinery won't. So the real question is, when it all seizes up and fails, what do we do at that point? And the good news, history tells us that people do emerge, sometimes for the better and sometimes not. But eventually they do emerge. You get people in the jobs because they've got brains, character, and they're competent. We have placed no value on that for decades. Mm -hmm. So he says, well, is there anybody you like in politics? I said, well, there is someone that I did like. And they said, really? I said, yeah, I, I kind of liked Eisenhower. <laughs> and they say, why? 
I said, well, he was a man who was very sensitive to our limitations. He knew what we could and could not tolerate. He understood that the war in Korea was something we would not support long term. Mm -hmm. And he brought it to an end under the best terms that he could get. And he reasoned at the time, you know, we really don't want a war of annihilation with China because someday we'll want to do business with them. Gosh, what an idea. We're not thinking about that right now. Whenever you try to build an end, an end state to any conflict, the one that's happening today in Ukraine, any of the ones that we've had, you're always trying to forge a, a solution which will leave everybody with something good in hand so that everyone has a stake in the outcome. We do the opposite. We, we insist it's our way or the highway. Well, how has that worked out? Didn't work in Vietnam. I don't think it worked in Iraq. Hasn't worked in Syria. Certainly didn't work in Afghanistan. And again, we're saying to the Russians, it's our way or the highway. That's not going to work. And that's the wrong way to do business. But we're dealing with ideologues. It's back to this sort of self-delusional business about, well, we represent democracy and goodness. Yes, right. Right. <laughs> there are a lot of people in this country that have no confidence or faith in our electoral system, and they have good reasons to feel that way. So it would make more sense to me if we said, let's bring the troops home, put them on the southern border. Yeah, let's exactly. Let's secure the nation. Let's go after the criminals in our cities. And let's clean up this electoral process so people can have confidence that American citizens are the only ones voting and that those citizens are voting legally and get out of this massive, uh, you know, absentee ballot fraud, right. which the French tried and other countries have tried and threw away because it was just an opportunity for mass an opportunity fraud. for fraud. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, thank you so much for your time, uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor. And I will have below uh, the links to your op ed piece uh, and the other ones that you've done uh, more recently and also the books uh is is it okay to do it on amazon or do you have a website that you prefer Doesn't, well you can link to my website all the okay, books i'll do that as well I'll do that yeah and all thanks right. very much for thinking of me i appreciate it absolutely it was a great interview thank you so much for your insights and your wisdom i appreciate it okay bye-bye